I want to go back uh, for a minute to 1999, when Guido Van Rossum, the creator of the Python programming language, uh, submitted a grant proposal uh, titled Computer Programming for Everybody. And in this grant proposal, he stated, we compare the mass ability to read and write software with mass literacy and predict equally pervasive changes across society. And I'd like to think that Jupyter is a project that not only uses Python and began as IPython, but that we actually are continuing in the legacy of these ideas, but we are now moving them into a world of data. So imagine a world where using Jupyter is as natural for anyone as using email or the web where data analysis, computation, and principled, clean, robust statistical inference are pervasive, not just pervasive among scientists, engineers, and mathematicians, but across disciplines. And this becomes a common language for society to work on our most challenging problems. That world is not the beautiful and inspiring Jupiter that unfortunately has a misspelling and uses an I instead. Uh, I'm talking about this world a little bit closer to home. For those of you who haven't uh, been to our campus, this is the UC Berkeley uh, main Doe Library and the iconic Campanile um, in, in California. And these two photographs were taken this week. So the top picture um, is the inaugural lecture for a course called Data 8, uh, Foundations of Data Science. And that's a lecture with 1300, approximately 1,300 students. Um, if you've been to campus, um, you, may notice, you may have noticed that that is not a regular classroom. That is Zellerbach Hall, which is uh, the theater where the symphony uh, plays and where operas are performed, because we don't have lecture halls that can fit 1,300 people anymore. Um, the photograph at the bottom was taken last night. And uh, that's a lecture that I was supposed to be delivering, but I'm uh, here playing hooky uh, with you folks. Um, and that is the opening class for a course called Data 100, which is an upper division course in data science that has now close to 800 students. And before I go further, uh, I want to clarify that this is not only happening at UC Berkeley. Okay, this is happening. I know that things of this kind are happening elsewhere. Many of you are developing similar things and ideas. And uh, I simply want to think of this presentation as a case study of what, what I am seeing close to me. But, but I recognize that uh, similar developments are happening elsewhere, and you are contributing to those. So what is that course? What is this giant course, Foundations of Data Science? It's a course that was developed to teach core concepts in inference and computing by working with real-world data for everyone. It welcomes freshmen who come into campus with no mathematical prerequisites other than those uh, needed for admission to the university. And its focus is to try to teach it, the key foundational ideas of introductory statistics, but via a very computationally driven hands-on approach, rather than proving theorems and proving uh, mathematical ideas uh, with uh, probability theory or calculus. Instead, these are built up in a constructive way with computing. And because they are illustrated using real-world data, questions of ethical impact and human context can be woven naturally into the development. That course is powered by Jupyter. You can all go right now, well, hopefully a little bit later, if you want to pay attention for a minute. Um, you can go to inferentialthinking.com and read the textbook for the class. Uh, the textbook is called Computational and Inferential Thinking. It has been developed uh, by uh, faculty both in statistics and computer science jointly. And as you read the book and you page through the chapters, you will see little buttons at the top that say interact. Those buttons allow anyone to click on them and for a few seconds, you will get a little spinning logo uh, uh, from, a, from the Binder homepage. And then you will be logged in without having to install anything into a live version of the textbook with notebooks available for you to try. So anyone in the world can not only read but actually work on this textbook simply by clicking on these links. For the faculty who are developing these materials, we've also developed uh, at Berkeley tools to make it as easy as possible to have textbooks that are okay, thank you. Um, textbooks so that faculty can focus on the development of their content and simply write markdown files in Jupyter Notebooks and with one click um, have that material be available to others as a textbook. Now, with this kind of infrastructure, what we're seeing is these become the fastest growing courses in Berkeley's history. Data 8 now has something around uh, 
1,300 students, as I mentioned, with a long wait list. And the combined annual numbers for the course, if we include spring, summer, uh, and fall sessions, are close to 3,000 students, but we're still have, we still have large wait lists. The annual enrollment at Berkeley is around 7,500 students, which means once we can meet capacity, once we're not limited, uh, we have no, no giant wait lists and students who simply can't take the course because we can't, uh, we can't uh, offer it to them, it's, it's very reasonable to think that we'll be reaching something like 50% of the entire university um, every, every, every year. As those classes go through, that, uh, that is going to set some very interesting changes. Now, on campus, uh, students do not have to use uh, the, binder, uh, the binder tool, which is kind of a, a way of, of seeing the, the book as a demo. They actually can log in with their university ID, and anyone at Berkeley can go to datahub.berkeley.edu and has a server available to them. The, uh, all of this was created with the open tools that uh, some here and many of you in this community have helped develop uh, to give you a, uh, a few quick tech notes on how this works. It was we run it in the cloud, but with a, with a, with a very strong ethos of being agnostic uh, to vendors. Um, it has run in the past on Rackspace. It has run on Google uh, infrastructure, on Azure. It has been run on local clusters on campus. Um, and obviously, there is some complexity to this deployment. Um, if you are in an organization where uh, you want to do something like this on a smaller scale, I encourage you to look at the Littlest Jupyter Hub uh, or talk to UV Panda, one of our core engineers who is here. Um, which is a, a deployment that serves capacities of, say, 10, between 10 and 100 people without all of the layers of complexity that are needed for serving an entire university and potentially tens of thousands of cloud users. Um, an important point is that all of the system allows instructors to customize the actual image that they're going to deploy, and the process is beautiful. I, as an instructor, can make changes to the, the user image that users will be logged in. I make a pull request to the repo. I install the dependencies that I want. A few continuous integrations checks are made, and if everything passes, my changes go live. It's an absolutely spectacular way to work. Uh, I basically make pushes to GitHub, I check Travis CI, and it's live for all my students. Um, this infrastructure allows us to serve students at about, give or take, $2 per student per week, um, which is a very reasonable price. And an important point is that it opens the door for access despite uh, trying to lower uh, economic barriers. We do have many students for whom we cannot assume um, at UC Berkeley that they own uh, a modern top-end laptop, and that's not an issue because they can walk into the library, they can borrow from the library a Chromebook, just like they can check out a book, and we, using that Chromebook, they log in and we provide all the infrastructure. So in terms of economic barriers, uh, this is infrastructure that really makes a difference. I've talked about Data 8 and Data 100, but there's actually a constellation of additional educational materials built around that that I'm going to speak for a moment about. Um, first, we have what are called connector courses. Data 8 is foundational ideas in data science, fairly generic and applicable to, any do to, to many domains with data sets that pretty much everyone can be familiar with. But on top of Data 8, these connector courses have been developed effectively to attach to it and go deeper in various directions. So someone may be interested, more interested in, in more technical work in statistics and probability theory. Someone may be interested in algorithms. Someone may be interested in sports analytics, cancer therapy, geography legal issues. All of these courses now take those foundational ideas and use data it as a prerequisite for students to, to broaden their knowledge in the areas that they now potentially intend to major in. And there's a second layer of educational resources that potentially has had even bigger impact, which are called data science modules. These are little fragments meant to cover one or a few lectures to be dropped into existing courses. The connectors are new courses, whereas the modules are meant to enrich existing courses so that faculty who may be interested in bringing data science to their domain but don't necessarily have the skills and expertise to develop entire new courses can say, oh, I will partner with your team, and you will help me with this infrastructure and with the content development on the technical side while I provide the expertise of my domain, say in cognitive science or American cultures, and we will build together a little module that I can then drop into my existing courses. And this also means that it doesn't require modifying the entire curriculum. They can be put everywhere. And so this is helping these ideas spread towards the entire campus. Um, throughout that, um, in April of this year, we had a new major approved in data science. 
And if we look at who is taking these courses, we see a huge spread of majors. Every, every, uh, every college and every division in the letters and sciences is represented. Uh, we have students from about 73 majors and with a, with a much better gender distribution that is typical in the STEM courses on campus. So I think it is realistic to, to think that in a few years, as this go wave goes through, Berkeley will indeed be a place where these tools are as commonplace as using Gmail. And what we're seeing, and these are the words of Sierra Martinez, a, a biologist, a postdoc in, bio, in microbiology, in molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley, we are witnessing a monumental phase shift in data science knowledge on campus. Our undergrads are extremely well trained, but this is creating a knowledge gap where effectively the undergrads know more than their faculty and their PIs about this, and those faculty are incapable of knowing how to manage the full potential of undergraduate help. So we're seeing this interesting sort of inversion of, of, of skills. How was all of this built? Um, we didn't have a $50 million donation to build this. What we had were people, uh, specifically Professor Catherine Carson, a historian of science, and our new dean of data science, David Collar, who led a team of mostly undergraduate students with whom they bootstrapped all of this, along with staff who have uh, done a lot of the engineering work. Um, and they've constructed an organization with, uh, that has been able to build this with really minimal, uh, otherwise minimal resources and infrastructure. Catherine Carson has engaged faculty from all across the campus um, and being very, very considerate of bringing data science to the faculty so that they can, in their own terms, change how they, uh, uh, basically dictate how they absorb these ideas and, and change their own teaching. Having always a, a mindset of respect and inclusion, especially with the fact that computer science and tech in many places, but specifically at Berkeley, it's one of the largest majors on campus, one of the richest departments. It may be perceived as a little bit hegemonic or imperialistic by, by other disciplines, and there's been a lot of work being done to prevent that by addressing it as a real issue rather than trying to hide it, and by using these students as ambassadors, and as Catherine says, giving them the keys to the kingdom and just letting them run wild and build things, having ethical considerations woven into this construction from the start um, across all of these disciplines. And with all of that, she's, uh, they've been able to really build in a very bootstrapped way, with very few resources, with a lot of uncertainty, a very high-functioning organization that, has really, that is really transforming the university. Now, as I said, it's not just, just at Berkeley. Uh, we recognize that. This is data that um, Carol Willing already mentioned yesterday. The count of publicly available notebooks on GitHub has recently crossed 2.5 million notebooks, and it shows no sign, that growth shows no sign of slowing down. And it's not only us here uh, uh, in, uh, in the US, actually our civilized neighbors to the north uh, are doing work at a, on a national scale, where they are actually deploying educational infrastructure from K through, uh, in the K through 12 space, um, all the way to research infrastructure available to all Canadian researchers in HPC. And there's actually a talk later today called Canadians Land on Jupiter, where they discuss some of this work. So we really are seeing a transformation. Um, and I would like to know, to think about what this means for the future. Where are we headed? If you teach, how will you teach when your undergraduate students have this new baseline, which may be above yours in, in certain dimensions? Um, if you do research, what kind of research will you do when you can hire even your undergrad interns come with these skills, or, and your graduate students, therefore, come with this? What products will you build in industry when the workforce that is coming to you has these skills on a massive scale? Um, and how do we train these students not only in data skills, but also in becoming healthy contributors to open science and, and, and open software development at this scale, which is a challenge? So I don't have the answers, but I know that with this community, we will hopefully, as Carol said, by 2023, have some wonderful ideas, and I'd like to thank you for your attention.